morning. The Souths are here this morning. That's Chris and Heather. Why don't you guys stand up? Proud parents. Why don't you stand up where you are? I want you all to take a good look at them. Oh, Chris is not here. Stand back up. We want to make sure we see who we're talking about. Thank you very much. Yeah, give them. Now, they didn't just have a baby. I want to be clear about that. That's what you thought, didn't it? Well, uh, if you don't know, their son happens to be Chris Wiles, the pastor here in church. It, it, that's his nephew. And um, an interesting thing happened. Uh, I just found out about this morning. And just for the record, I'm not telling something they didn't tell I could tell because some of you would come up and beat me up afterwards after I tell you what I'm going to tell you. But So here's what happened. <laughs> she came in this morning, and, I, and he always has quotable quotes. I mean, he's like a miniature Chris on steroids. He's a pretty, pretty good kid. And, and so, so uh, she uh, was sharing with me that, uh, Heather was sharing with me that uh, he'd been out playing in the mud. And uh, um, he came back in, and they had several dialogues about it. But he looked down at his shoes, and I'm not going to say the words, so don't get excited. You understand, this kid is so cool. He's so nice, and he's a sweet kid, isn't he? I mean, he really is. <clears throat> He looks down at his shoes at his mom and he says, I don't like these blank shoes. Now, I didn't say the word, so don't go telling somebody I went cussing in a sermon. I mean, this is our sweet little guy, Chris on steroids, loves Jesus, right? He loves Jesus to death. But he says, I don't like these blank shoes. Well, let me tell you, I know Chris and Heather, and that's probably, he did probably did not get that word from them. Now, if he did, I'm open for counseling on Monday beginning at 4. But he probably didn't get that word from them. The truth is, is he lives in a culture that is saturating his mind with lots and lots of data, right? And I dare say that if I went and talked to several of the parents in here, you've had a very similar experience. Well... <clears throat> This morning we're talking about this whole idea of why I worship. And, and um, well, let me tell you about another situation where an individual found themselves in this place where this culture that they'd immersed themselves in, and not because like this little guy, they didn't have any chance at all of getting out of it, but because of some choices they made. I call it the 20-something nightmare, and this is the way it went. At age 18, she graduated from high school. Incredibly brilliant, streetwise young lady. By 19, she had her own, uh, her own car that was paid for. She had her own apartment that she'd pay for and that she, uh, she was paying for. And she had money in the bank and she'd bought all of her furniture. She was doing pretty well. And she was on her way up uh, doing things in, in the business world. Very excited about life. She'd grown up in a, in a setting where uh, Christ was honored in her home. She'd grown up in a setting where she had the incredible benefit of a, a great youth group that really chased after Jesus. But at about 19, there was a shift in her. You see, she decided to give attention to or give her life to or give uh, the focus of her life or, dare I say, her worship to finding a guy. Now, let me be clear. I'm all for women finding guys. Karen found me, and I'm a blessed man. Notice I didn't say she was a blessed woman. Yeah, yeah, but I'm a blessed man with that, so I'm all for women finding men. But here's what I want you to see. In this 20-something nightmare, now getting a guy became the whole focus of her life. It became that which she worshipped. And so what she found herself in is new relationships and the first one that she went into as she left as she she left uh, that grounding that she'd received in all those years she'd invested in her relationship with Christ and all the benefit of the community that really encouraged her to walk with Christ and share her faith in Christ and she began to compulsively go after men because having a man was going to be the thing that defined her and so every ounce of energy she had got poured into that and she went through man after man. In the process, she lost her car because the first guy she was with was a bum and didn't work, so she had to sell it so they could eat. 
And then after that didn't work out, after a little while, she went to another man and another man and another man. And then now another man, and, and this time as uh, they were doing the wild thing together, having sex, uh, she ended up pregnant. But that guy was a bum, and so now he's out of the picture, and there's another guy involved. And her life becomes more and more complicated. And the desperateness of her life is clearly defined and understood by the fact that she continues to go after this thing, this thing called a man, to define who she is. Now, by the way, I'm not trying to be overly critical or even condescending. What I'm telling you, what I'm asking you to do is ask this simple question. How did this 20-something-year-old end up in a place where she understood Christ? She understood what it was to trace, chase after him. I'll tell you how. She began to worship at a particular altar that was not the living God of the universe. And as she involved herself, not just with those men, but with that community of people that sort of operated that way, the changing values in her own life took her to a place where to this day she remains in a very self-destructive state. Now, are you with me and are saying that's sad? I'm, I'm not out to beat her up. I'm just telling you, it's, it's a sad, sad place, and I hurt deeply for her. But I want you to recognize that that shift happened because the worship that was in her life, <clears throat> actually, the things she worshipped, began the very core of how she did life. It changed the core of her character. You following me so far? And so now here's what one fellow says about it. Actually, we've uh, mentioned him once before. David Foster Wallace, and I quote to you, he says, In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason may be choosing for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much everything else will eat you alive. It's interesting because in that statement, he comes to one of the first definitions that we see in the Scriptures with the idea of what actually is worship to define worship. Um, <clears throat> the first definition of worship is the carving to fulfill the crave. And if you look in Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 8 to 10, this is not the whole passage, but uh, God's dealing with Israel, and then through the prophet Jeremiah, he's basically saying, you're toast. And he says, you've been making offerings to other gods, and you may be cut off and a curse, and you have not humbled yourself, and you have not feared the Lord. In other words, you haven't worshipped the Lord. You haven't given Him His attention. You have not made Him the goal of your life to discover Him and somehow this incredible relationship that He designed but to, or defined or wanted to happen that He designed you for. The word out there for making offerings is literally they carved out images so they could bow down and worship them. I'd like to, like, like to suggest to you that all of us have that same longing to be connected in a relationship with God. One fellow put it like this, is that we all have a hole in our heart. The hole can only be filled by love and acceptance, and that love and acceptance can only be filled by the God of the universe, not because you made a decision for that. God put that longing within you. And the problem is we keep crafting things or going after more and more things to try to fulfill the longing within. Wallace continues to put it like this, just in terms of practical. He says, when you worship money and things, you'll never have enough. When you worship the body and beauty and sexual lure, you'll always feel ugly, and as you grow older, you'll die me and death every single morning when you get up to look in the mirror. When you worship power, you'll end up feeling weak and afraid, and you'll need ever more power over others so you can numb your fear that you're weak. If you worship your intellect, you'll end up feeling stupid, you'll feel like a fraud, and you're always on the verge of being found out. And if anybody were to suggest you were stupid, they need to watch out. He says the insidious thing is this, <clears throat> about these things that we run after, that we worship, they're unconscious. You don't get up in the morning and say, I want to figure out how I can lead my relationship with God. I want to figure out how I can change my character. I want to figure out how I can not go to these other things uh, or uh, not go to God. But he says the truth is, is you gradually slip into them and I begin to measure my value by them and so I can't live without them without ever being fully aware that you're doing it. 
there was a gentleman I knew once, and I would describe to you and tell you that he had a consuming emptiness within him. I call it the 40-something nightmare. Just as he was about to reach age 40, he he gained every single goal that he set out in life to be worth millions, to own his own company, to have art, very similar to what's on the, uh, the uh, uh, wall right now, to be hung in some pretty famous places, to have a boy and a girl, a son and daughter, and to build, build and design his own house with a deck that could uh, hold 50 people. And he did all that, and then finally one day came home, driving in his new car, pulled in his garage, realizing at 3 in the afternoon that he had actually accomplished everything he set out to accomplish. And he sat and weeped for three hours till his wife came home. He was suicidal and just wanted out of this life because there was nothing else to consume. He had arrived at all his goals in life, but he had arrived empty. You see, there is a consuming emptiness that's involved with us and that comes within us when we do not go after our Creator, when we worship the things of this world rather than the Creator of this world. Augustine uh, cited the Song of Solomon in Song of Solomon uh, two, verse 2 and verse 4 says this He brought me into the house this is, this is Solomon's describing this love relationship between this uh, uh, which mirrors our relationship with the Lord he says he brought me into this uh, to me to the banqueting table and his banner over me was love and this is what he says he brought me into the cellar of wine and he set order love in me Augustine talks about it, and actually several do, this whole idea that there's an order to love. Chris mentioned it just, the other, just a couple of weeks ago, that there's an order to love. And God designed it that God and the relationship with him and the love I discover from him and the love I receive from him absolutely has to be first place in my life. But when I get to, and, and when it does, it then impacts all the other relationships. So see, here's the truth. If you're married to somebody, you want to make sure they got their relationship with God sorted out because when you're boneheaded, you're going to be in deep trouble if they don't have the relationship with God sorted out. Do you follow that? You see, if it sorts out when you're in business with somebody, you better hope that that person has a priority that's been developed, his character's been developed, <coughs> excuse me, by interacting with the God of the universe that, that has a set of character, a way to approach life, a sacrificial approach to life. Or otherwise, you're going to be on the losing end of that. You see, our loves determine our character. Just like the 20-something nightmare, just like my friend in the 40-something nightmare who loved the things of this world and all the things he could accomplish and the thrill-seeking and everything else. All of those things have the ability, what we love, our character will be shaped by the practices that compose the way we worship. And specifically by the way we worship God or we worship the things of this world. So as you look in Exodus chapter 31, verse 1, which is our passage for today, you see this very simple scripture. I will bless the Lord at all times, and I will praise Him continually. My praise will continually be in my mouth. So the first very simple thing we learned about love is this, uh, worship is it's an all-the-time worship. So when we start thinking about it, yes, we worship when we come here together, and we're going to talk about that. But understand that it's an all-the-time event. It's it's. It's every part of my life and being. It's all, all times. It isn't just relegated to a particular time on a Sunday morning. Now, here's the problem with you not thinking that this is an all-the-time all the experience, the idea of worship. If I'm in a place where I see that worship is something that happens on Sunday morning, I place myself in a very dangerous position. Because you see, if I come to church and the church I'm with does a really great job of putting together worship, they have great music, the sound works just right, uh-huh. uh, 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 and, uh, and everything's slick and the pastor actually did an okay job on Sunday morning, I walk away and I go, yeah, okay, now that's it. Particularly if while they were having the singing and things, I had this sense, this worship, and chill down the spine, I mean, that gets it, that, that cinches the whole thing. You see, the danger is, is that I come to church as an observer to experience worship or to experience a feeling that feels like worship. Now, it's really interesting. If we were to go and uh, interview people, everybody would have a different feeling about what that might look like. 
But if worship is everything I do, I can actually show up on a Sunday morning and have something really bad happen. But if I've come to worship, which we will define for you, then God can speak to me. I have a good friend, youth minister friend, back when I was about 26 years of age. We planned this huge camp, and we had about 600 kids come to the camp, and everybody knew that this guy could not sing. He knew he could not sing. And we begged him, if we were standing beside him in worship, please don't open your mouth. If you do, pretend like you're mouthing the words, be silent. And so it's the last night, and I'm supposed to preach, you know, because we're going to have the big, you know, people come down to the front and all that. So I'm supposed to preach, and we're in the middle of worship. And that night I was leading worship too. And we were taking a bit of a break, and he comes up to me and he says, I'm supposed to sing a song. And I thought he was joking. Because the guy was really, really, I can't even fake how bad he was. And I said, well, brother, listen, I've got the worship planned out just perfectly. You know, we're moving the folks to understand to worship God and to come to his throne and so on. And and it's preparation for the word. And he says, "I, I know all that, but I'm pretty sure the Lord told me I'm supposed to sing this song. Well, i got to tell you, it wasn't in my plan. But I let him do it only because he's my friend. There was nothing spiritual about it. I really didn't care the Lord had said it. I just didn't want him to be mad at me. So he gets up and he sings. And I'm going to tell you, there was no miracle. It was the worst I've ever heard anybody do. He was off key. He actually got the verses rearranged and sang in the wrong place. But as he began to sing, I looked back over the crowd, and I'm going, this is horrible. He's just in the mood. I'll never be able to preach now. And you know what happened? God decided that people were going to learn through the one song. Because, see, my friend came to worship. And by the end of the song, and he wasn't a crier. I'd never seen the guy cry. By the end of the song, he was bawling. And I looked out. And people in the crowd were starting to pull aside and pray for each other. You see, I was mistaken in believing that worship was something that I create for a particular moment when people get together to evoke a particular emotional response. But the truth is, is God had something totally in mind that didn't depend on my cunning, my great musician, uh, musical ability, my great ability to sing. And by the way, I didn't even get to preach that night. Because there was so much going on of worshiping in spirit and truth that God did something that didn't need me to get up and run my mouth. And you say, well, can we do that now? And the answer is no. (laughs) You see, worship is all the time. But if I try to make worship into an experience, I actually miss what God's doing when I do get together with the brothers. But not only is worship that, in verse 2 he says this, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. You see, worship demands all of me. The whole idea of the soul is your mind, will, and emotions. What you think, feel, and decide. And so really we've come on another definition of worship here. First was carving to fill the craving. But the second one is to <clears throat> prostrate oneself, to bow down, and to lift up holy hands. And I want to talk to you about that a second. So the idea of worship is you're considering what are we doing? Why do we worship? I want you to understand it involves every single part of you, and and we'll unpack that as we go along. But it does involve some form of your body participating and your mind participating and your emotion participating. She said, and some of you are saying, okay, I know what he's going to do now. He's going to beat us up because I don't raise my hands. He's going to beat us up because we ought to be a praying church that's on their knees and so on and so forth. No, I'm not doing that, but I do want you to know this. If you come to this place to worship, or if you come to the place to worship when you're somewhere privately with the Lord, I need you to recognize that God calls you to be all in. This is not some cursory exercise that doesn't engage your mind and doesn't engage your emotion, even if you don't show those emotions on the outside. That whole idea in Scripture, excuse me, in the Jewish culture, and really passed on uh, to Christian worship with this. You hear people I lift up holy hands to the Lord. We have several songs that say that. Now, I'm not going to make you do anything weird, so just one time humor me, okay? Everybody put your hand up. You don't even have to put it all the way up. You can just put it right here. Just right here. Just for a second. 
I promise I'm not going to do anything weird. Okay. The idea of, just hold them there just for a second. The idea of lifting up holy hands, if some of you, some of you are dying to do that, so go ahead. The rest of you can go. Okay, yeah, yeah. But the idea of lifting up holy hands is, God, I'm offering you every, you can put your hands down. I'm offering you every single part of me. You got me. My heart, my soul, my mind, everything I think about, I'm presenting myself to you. And the assumption is that that offering begins to start at something. It's permission for the Lord to do the kinds of things that he knows how to do. So worship is saying, Lord, I'm coming with all of myself. The next definition is in verse 3. He says, Oh, magnify the Lord and let us exalt his name together. This is in Psalms 33. I don't know why I have Exodus on the slide. See, you wouldn't have even caught that if I hadn't said it, would you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All the analyticals out there say, I can't listen for the rest of the time. I'm going to be compulsing on the Exodus. Now, the whole idea is, oh, magnify the Lord with me. You know what it means to magnify something? You get the magnifying glass and look at it. It looks bigger. You determine all the ins and outs and the specifics of it. You actually discover as much as you can, and you look at it again and again and again. And he says, we're supposed to magnify the Lord or look at the Lord and look at all the things that are true about his character, about how he interacts with me as a person, what relationship actually looks like, and his consistency. And by the way, the latter part of this uh, Psalm 34 is just about that, them talking about the amazing qualities that the Lord has and how he interacts with us. But he says, all of us, worship is a thing that all of us participate in, which, of course, brings me to this third definition of what worship is. It's a gathering for the work of magnifying. Now, stick with me here. The word liturgy is, per, is a perfectly good biblical term, and it shouldn't just be uh, jettisoned. Because the noun, liturgia, literally means the work of the people. It means service or ministry. And the verb is to minister or to serve. It's used in Acts 13, verse 2, and it's used to describe the church's worship. Uh, he says that they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. Oh, by the way, how many of you fasted before you came to worship service this morning to hear from the Lord? The New Testament uses these words for various aspects of service. Forgiving the poor in Romans 15 and verse 27. For the ministry of people, Philippians chapter 2 verse 17. And the service of carrying on the apostolic message. And that's in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. So it's not a surprise that the church actually used the word liturgy to describe what happened when they got together. Now I understand we don't use that word around here very much. And even though our literally liturgy may change and even though you how many of you came from a more, a more mainline background uh, in, your, in your background for your faith well if you did you, you might have heard the word liturgy and it might have seemed a little more structured to you but whether or not it's structured or not or whether or not it's written down in front of you or in a book of prayers <clears throat> the truth is those things happen to help direct the worship for people to worship the living God Worship always centered around two things, the word and the table. In the Old Testament, it carried the idea of looking at the precepts of God and looking at myself in relationship to that and discovering the wisdom of that. It also involved the table, the idea of celebrating more specifically the Passover when Israel came out of Egypt and the deliverance of God in that. Looking forward to Christianity, of course, the whole idea was is that the focus now is on the gospel and Jesus Christ and how he's a fulfillment of all that they'd heard before and then specifically around the Lord's table. And the idea there was just simply this, that we're celebrating the amazing resurrection power of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. So all those things are a part of the celebrating the covenant of sacrifice. This means that in our celebrating, frankly, we're celebrating Jesus through the word and the table. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20 to 25, there's an amazing passage talks us I did come together he says this and let me just summarize 9 21 to 25 he says we have such a great high priest let us draw near with a true heart full of assurance and faith let us hold fast the confession of our hope verse 23 let us consider how to stir up one another with love and good works 
And let us not neglect to meet together as the habit of some is. I want to make this as simple as I know how. He's saying that it's difficult for you to hold on to this place that you've come to. That just operating independently of other believers is not going to get it. Because when I'm not involving myself with believers in, in worship, and I'm not just talking about what happens on Sunday, then I have a danger of not being able to hold fast to this faith. Not just the teaching, but that which I've learned from Christ and the transformation that's happened. So he says, don't neglect meeting together the way some are, are, are doing it. So in simple terms, this is it. Evidently, the, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews saw incredible value in people coming together in this thing that we call worship. So much so that if we would come together, it would stir us up to love and to good works. I'd like to talk with you just a little bit about some of the things that we do when we come together. I'd suggest to you that when you come together, this whole idea of being stirred up to love and to good works, the idea of when I worship, it transforms my character, begins when you're coming in these doors, when you pull into the parking lot. Okay, now, if you don't want to do this because you don't want to admit you had a fight, how many of you were not happy when you pulled in the door, uh, when you pulled into the parking lot this morning? Okay, I got a few. Raise your hand. I got news for you. I've been mad for two weeks. No, you don't get to know what it's about. I've been mad for two weeks. I've been very angry with a particular situation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I was coming in the door this morning, or not, not in the door, but when I was driving in my car up, here I am preaching, getting ready to preach, and all I'm consumed with is that I need to make them pay. Well, now, have I completely abandoned my faith because of that? No. But I got news for you. It's very easy for you to go worshiping what you can carve out to fix your own life. And that's exactly what I was doing even this morning. But one of the benefits to coming to the place, and I don't, I don't mean just preaching, but interacting with you. When I came in this morning, I've had five conversations with people who have at their heart to walk with Christ who are struggling with particular issues that has to do with them fleshing out what Christ is doing in them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it, it, we could even bring them up and have them share that with you because it was some incredible stories or some deep concerns that people had. And as I experienced that, all five of them this morning, this is what I realized. I don't want to be angry. I, more specifically, I don't want to take revenge. I want the living presence of Christ, the one to release that to him and do the kind of thing that I need to do towards this person that now I believe to be my enemy. Well, you know what? Tr truthfully, I could have done without church this morning. I didn't even need the worship. I don't even need my sermon because the five people that came to me before were worshiping. As they came in, we began to dialogue and interact with each other and the presence of Christ in them and in me begin to stir up and bring me to a place where I don't want the things of this world anymore. When it comes to worship through music, we worship through music, <clears throat> excuse me, and when you think about worshiping through music, you can come in, and of course, about half the time, you can usually find something in what we do in worship that you don't like, or that didn't go well, or the sound wasn't right, or the, and so on. And while I appreciate our musicians so much that they invest so much time and energy in doing that, the truth is there's lots of things can go wrong. But I just want you a simple task. Whether you're a singer or not a singer, do you have the ability to think about the words? Do you have ability to be singing in your heart, good biblical concept, and to actually dialogue with yourself and the creator of this universe as you're participating with other believers and recognizing that this is what the scriptures teach. Because we're all one body and we have one spirit, what I do in worship affects you. And so the whole idea is when I come to worship, I should choose to engage in what's actually happening with the music. Let me give you an example. Are you familiar with the song Oceans? Anybody remember that song? Okay, well, there's a phrase in there that I'm going to say to you right now that you probably are not going to like. It says this. Lord, take me where my feet would never lead me. 
And the next part of it is talking about in deep oceans, waves overcome me. It's the whole point of the song. How many of you, when you got up this morning, said, you know, today's a good day for God to take me all the places I don't want to go? Today's a good day for a lesson. You know, one of those hard lessons, the ones that just hit you right in the gut. But you know what? I've sung that song a dozen times, and it wasn't until about a month ago that I recognized that I didn't know I wanted to be praying that prayer that morning. And you know why? Because as I participated in it with you, I recognized there's some places he needs to take me that right now I am unwilling to go. How about you? You see, worship is not this observation sport. This, this, it is a participation in what we're doing and other things and announcements. It's staying informed about the activity of God in the body and making decisions to be involved with it. The idea of uh, we worship by giving our offering financially. Again, I remind you what this, uh, 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 the epistles teach us is this, is that as I make decisions before I get here even about if I'm going to give and I pry that money out of my pocket, the scriptures teach that there's this thing that goes on between God and I. And it challenges me to such a point that it creates righteousness in me as I, as I, it creates righteousness in me as I struggle with him about those things. We worship through preaching and turning our minds to the Scripture. Um, It's really interesting. This is the best time in the world to go to a worship service and ignore everything in the history of mankind, to to go to a worship service and not have to be impacted by it at all. Christine, now you have the Bible on your iPhone. And if anybody says, were you texting to us? No, I was just looking up a passage. You know, that was really pretty interesting. You know, I can pretend I'm listening and I'm not. And my point is this, that there's so many things that distract us, but worship says, I'm going to engage in this, first of all, to take it in for myself, but then this. You know, and not just the conversation class, but ask yourself a simple question. When was the last time you sat in a sermon, and maybe you do this all the time, and praise Jesus if you do, but when was the last time that you involved yourself in a sermon, a teaching in some way, or even the music itself, and you went home, or right after the service, you got a hold of somebody and say, "Hey, how'd that get you today? Have you been when you were hearing that teaching today? Were, were you do you do you come to worship? Do you engage in the activity of worship when you come? When was the last time you actually had a conversation about the teaching and shared from your heart? This is where the Lord has either confirmed that there's an amazing work He's done in me, and I praise Him that He has already has, or this is a place He wants me to go. Because the truth." is as we sit after service after service after service and hear teaching and it makes it to the end of the door if you come in here and you hear teaching and it ends at the end of the door well you probably aren't going to hell but you aren't worshiping and here's the problem with not worshiping I then go out this door and worship everything else that has my focus and it begins to change my character away from the holiness of God You get it? Worship changes, transforms me into whatever I'm focusing on. And so there is an act of worship that I participate in. Just a couple more things. When we come around the Lord's table and remember his resurrection power. Excuse me. When we worship in corporate prayer for the needs of the body, somebody, one of those five people that shared with me earlier, came up to me and told me this beautiful story about someone she'd been praying for and the things that were stirring in her and that she knows is stirring in the person she's praying for. That kind of praying, both corporately and individually, begins to impact the lives and brings them more in line with the character of God. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 4 through 8, we see then finally the results of worship. I got Exodus again. Well, amen. We see, here's, here's, here's the good news. My friend Mike Wells, that I was my mentor for years, he says, Tim, you realize you you realize you're going to be completely exposed and messing up in front of everybody for the rest of your life. And I said, Well, okay, why? He says, Oh, the Lord never ever wants anybody to follow one man. So he says, Every teacher has a great glaring mistake, a fault in their life. And he says, They usually don't know it, but he says, You know it and can't do anything about it. Well, let's get on. <laughs> <laughs> Psalms 34, 4 through 8. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. And now we come on to our last definition of worship, which is this, that it's offering oneself 
but it's also transforming. Worship is the act of offering oneself and a transforming of everything that is me. In Psalms 34, 4 to 7, we see in this passage, and just quickly he says, Lord, as I interact with you, you deliver me from my fears. He says, to those who are radiant, their faces shall never be ashamed. Do you know what the idea of your face being radiant is? You've had a release. Let me ask you, how many of you, take your mind back for a second to a time, those of you who are Christ followers, where you actually forgave someone. You engaged by forgiving someone. Get it in your mind right now. You remember how freeing that was? If we could have taken a picture of your face when you decided to forgive, it would have been radiant. There's, there's a weight. The, the, the depression leaves when I let go of things like that. That's only one small part of what the creator of this universe does as I worship him. <clears throat> Excuse me. I never carry that guilt with me again. He says this in verse 6, The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Let me ask you, can you identify with the fact that over this last two weeks I've been so incredibly angry and I've wanted revenge so much for this thing that it's actually sapped everything else from me? And by the way, why don't I just tell you where I went worshiping rather than worshiping the Lord? My wife doesn't know this, so I might as well tell you now, and I'm not making this up, so it would be a clever sermon illustration. This last week, two, last two weeks, every waking, uh, every moment I've had that I haven't been working, I've been eating. I don't really care what you think about that. What I know is this, that I've been worshiping the God of this world. And the reason I've been eating like that is I eat when I'm ticked to get rid of the pain from being ticked. You see, I've been worshiping at another place, and it changes my character to where now I'm feeling some of the same feelings I had for the years when I was actually addicted in every sense of the word to eating. He says, The angel of the Lord encamps all those around who fear him, and he delivers them. How's this for you? When you gather together with the body of Christ, when you worship, when you worship God all the time and all the things that you're involved in, in other words, you're actually engaging. So you're thinking about him when you're going to school. You're thinking about him when you're going in to eat. You're thinking about him in every situation that's going on in life. He says this, <clears throat> that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Fear is awe. I'm always looking for because I know that he has the answer. And he protects them. More specifically, it says, he delivers them. I'm telling you, I'm grateful to be delivered. And I don't mean just once. But do you know how free it is to me to be talking to you and just say, look, here it is. See, as we worship and we draw near to him, there's no fear in being exposed. Because the creator of this year earth delivers us. As we conclude, I want you to consider this. You need to be asking the question, who and what you're worshiping? Because you see, worshiping is not an option. Everyone is worshiping. Gabby Dance, in the magazine Humor on February 23, 2016, uh, posted an article uh, about Pinterest. And the title of the article is, True Life, I'm Addicted to Pinterest. I've never even been on it. She says, you may be addicted if you have a board for almost every aspect of your life. If every DIY project you've ever done has been, simp been inspired by something on Pinterest. If Pinterest is your primary search engine, and if anybody asks you to uh, use another one, you get mad. Uh, you might be addicted to Pinterest if you, you get super nervous when someone you know follows you. You might be addicted if every time you come across another person with the, an obsession for Pinterest, you want to be their close personal friend. You might be addicted if you've never looked back at the majority of things you've pinned. You always wait for things to come up in conversations that you can tie back to Pinterest. You might even be addicted if anyone tells you that uh, you go to Pinterest too much and you really, really get mad then. The last two... 
He says, you might be addicted if you already have your whole life planned out over Pinterest. And you might be addicted if you see your addiction as a blessing and not a problem. But see, here's the problem. A lot of people don't see worship than anything more than something you come to on a Sunday morning. Everybody does their thing. You did your deal, and you're done. And then you go out to worship all the things that get all your focus, all your attention, all your magnifying. So you need to be asking this morning, who and what am I worshiping? Chris uh, noted a, a, uh, 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 an article about uh, uh, Pinterest, <coughs> Pinterest uh, the other day and, or a few weeks back and quoted uh, Karina Chicano, and she says this, Nearly everyone I know, by that I mean everyone who spends vast, barren hundreds of time at her computer goes to websites like these to escape, distress, perk up, calm down, feel something, not feel something, distract themselves, and to modulate their pleasure and arousal. They go on to say, a friend of mine calls his addiction to those sites avenues for procrastination, but she says, I think it's more. This is what I think. These sites invoke a certain feeling. The feeling of being addicted, longing for something, specifically being addicted to the feeling that something is missing or incomplete. The point is not the thing that is being longed for, but instead the longing for the thing. Exodus chapter 34, verses 9 through 14, begins a beautiful dialogue. Psalm, sorry, thank you. Well, amen, amen. He says this, Taste of the Lord and see that he's good. And then down in verse 22, he says, The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I want your attention just for the last minute. Why do we worship? Well, we worship because you have to worship something. The truth is, is this unbelieving God that says everyone worships, worships everything, uh, everyone worships something, was absolutely correct. And he doesn't even value the scriptures. But as you have come here together to worship, in all of the things we do here and all the things you'll do outside, you have to walk out here asking a question. What are the things that have gotten my magnifying week after week, day after day? Because some change, some, some superficial change that happens because I come to a church on Sunday morning is not it. I worship with my whole life. We had the privilege of doing some counseling with a group called Hillsong in the years back when I was younger and with their worship team. And the number one problem they had with their worship team, and Hillsong has done some pretty incredible stuff, right, guys? You guys are involved in this? But do you know their number one problem was this? They were constantly losing worship leaders and people who were musicians because of this. They were always trying to out-to the album before. And they were, or they were trying to imitate the people that had come before so they could do worship really, really well. You see, they were imitating worship, not participating in worship. And as a result, it almost undid their entire worship ministry. You see, I'm just wondering this morning, where are you? Where are you? Do you come here and imitate worship? Do you come here like what happens in a lot of folks' lives? That... They come here and they imitate worship. And as long as it goes pretty well and everybody does the right thing, it feels like they've been to worship. But do you understand this whole idea in Romans letter chapter 1 and 2 is this, is that I offer myself to God. My body is a living sacrifice, which is my spiritual act of worship. And that means is as you worship God, if you come here and do it really well and get the feeling of worship, but as you leave this place, you act like you've offered nothing to him, and you sing things like this. Who are you to tell me how to live my life? Who are you to question about the decisions I'm making? Then quite frankly, you're imitating worship and not participating in the worship of the living God.
May God deliver us from imitation so that we can participate with the living God.